the reason we wanted to hold this um, conversation was really about um, trying to capture some of the challenges developing these larger scale developments in Papua New Guinea. So um, we've just finished, I think, the Range View um, Plaza or Heights proposal. So maybe we might start just talking about some of the features of that project, if that's all right, Paul, as far as how you go about putting together a large development like that in Papua New Guinea. What are the key components of that deal as far as Number One Super is concerned? Okay, so Number One Super, uh, just so people understand what Range View is, Range View is a, a shopping centre. It's actually just directly across the road from Vision City and it consists of a large supermarket and a couple of floors of retail shops in there as well as uh, a big food court and some restaurants and, and different things. That's one component of Range View. The second component is that there's 88 townhouses that have also been built uh, behind Range View with um, accommodation for, for those tenants, uh, including swimming pools and half courts and different things. Uh, that has actually been a, a joint venture process put together by NCDC. So they've come in, they've provided part of the land. Uh, so they're actually receiving now uh, revenue for that land that they've put in place. We've also come in partnership with Lamana Group, who are also involved with building that particular building, who hold a, a stake in it, and then the majority stake is held by Number One Super. Number One Super is quite a uh, heavily regulated environment. I think we had uh, many, many uh, business cases looking at how could we make this actually work and look for the return that we're, we're trying to generate for our particular members. So. One of the areas that we have to do as part of a superannuation fund is that we need to go through this investment proposal. We have external parties that oversee us and we need to make sure that when we're actually entering an environment of investing, and this total investment is about 350 million uh, across that particular Peter. site. 350 million yeah. keen, I'm sorry. Uh, um, and you, know, you, you want to make sure you're getting a return from our members over that period of time. It launched in May. And so it's just come up and, and started to, to go through. So tenancies are filling up, which is quite nice. It's about 90% of our tenants are actually in there uh, in the shopping precinct. So it's, it's actually up and running now. So um, it's a bit of a challenge in actually bringing those parties together. We have obviously different return objectives. We have different means of what we're actually trying to, to do. And then you also have the site and the issues around some of the areas uh, for there, there's still some challenges around parking and getting out of that particular site. We'd like to see some, some work done on roads and, and different things to make it a bit more convenient, as well as the bridge that joins the two, two shopping precincts. So even though you can have this nice shopping centre built, do you think you've got a bridge that joins the two? Well, not quite. You actually have to walk down and walk around. And so there's still different challenges that you have, even something that's, that's as big as that, and you think would actually work really functionally between those those two areas. Yeah. So how important is it to have a, 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 in a project like this to have a multiple use site, a site that can have different aspects, residential, retail and so on? How much of that is, is about like hedging yourself against different parts of the market for a longer term investment? I think yeah, it's, it's traded on to what we did in what we call the, uh, the OPH precinct where we have you know, a building, we have residentials, we have apartments, we have hospitality. So you're looking for what part of the market is actually going to work well for you at that particular point in time. Mm. Uh, we certainly were looking at what else we could do as far as bringing that shopping complex in and looking at bringing it under and being fully owned, if you like, by Papua New Guineans rather than the other shopping centre that's owned by other parties that potentially have uh, revenue going outside the country. This is fully owned by Papua New Guineans. So what we've been looking for is how can you actually also make sure that you're actually giving back to that country, you're creating those jobs. Uh, in the process, we we're quite fortunate to have jobs created on one of our sites, it finishes, and we've been able to move many of those workers who have developed different skills onto a new building complex. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we've actually started another project where some of those workers have had that continuity of moving from one site to another site and now onto a third site. So we're quite fortunate in looking at how we actually developing skills, maintaining those skills and having those jobs continue through in, in the workplace. So you know, a super fund, normally most people think of us as actually going off and investing money, which is an important part of it, but there's also that social side that we're actually generating jobs, employment, and then we're also using other companies and creating 
uh, in each of those premises, other businesses have actually sprung up and, and mm. are operating out of those particular sites. So it's a, a way of generating wealth for people, but also creating that further expansion of the economy. Now, Rupert, um, Steamship's Harbourside development is one of the signature uh, developments in the last decade, really, in, in downtown Port Moresby. And you're adding to that, uh, I think, later this year with uh, Harbourside South. Perhaps a little update on that project, if you wouldn't mind. But also, uh, again, one of the features of it is how you've managed to reasonably stay close to schedule, which, given the last two years, is quite extraordinary. Perhaps you talk a little bit about how you've been able to maintain momentum on a project of that size. Sure, thank you, Andrew. I mean, I think the uh, sort of talking about the, the project itself, yeah. it should complete uh, the first phase of it towards the end of the year, and that's the office and the retail block. Mm. And then the service departments will come on first quarter, early second quarter next year. Um, we will be bringing in a new international brand, um, hospitality brand, um, and that will be good. Uh, particularly in today's climate, it will sort of signal to the broader market that there are international companies prepared to come and put their name to Papua New Guinean investments. So is that in a similar way to the Grand Papua having a partnership with Radisson? Is that similar? It's, it's, a, yeah, similar. it's, a, yeah. it's a different brand, but yeah, same concept. Um, and um, I think one of the, to, to answer your question around how we managed to keep it on track mm. uh, through COVID, I think one of the interesting things um, for me looking at uh, developments in Papua New Guinea, they've matured considerably mm. in the last five, six years. Uh, we've got used, as an industry, we've got used to doing bigger projects. Mm. Of course, compared to resource projects, they're not nearly as large, but as a construction and development industry, we've mm. got used to doing these, these larger projects. And I think one of the key learnings of the early ones were that you need to have a very active and professional management team looking at that project management. And there's plenty of examples in the country where that's not worked so mm. well, perhaps one right next door to us uh, that people will be very familiar with. And it really comes down to project management skills, yeah. um, your own internal... In-house ones, yeah. Um, whether it's in-house or external, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, but the time has to be spent up front. Uh, and certainly we spent a lot of time at the beginning getting the contracts in place and getting our subcontractors in place mm -hmm. and getting our management structure in place. And that's paid huge dividends. Um, we are now running into some problems with, uh, with some of the Chinese components coming down, the finishing components. Uh, because of the Chinese lockdown, right? Um, but uh, you know the actual fabric of the construction uh, has mainly been done in country, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore we've not been reliant on the supply chain, uh, international supply chain that has been so challenged in the last mm. uh, couple of months, mm. in particular. Mm. George, we talked a little bit uh, previously, the two of us, about your supply chain challenges, and I guess the fact that you have a lot of be able to source a lot of the materials that you use to build the projects you're working on locally must be a significant advantage? Yeah, it is um, a significant advantage. So we, um, so I guess, uh, bringing it back to, to the group level, we've yeah. got, um, we're quite vertically integrated where we've got um, Hebo Constructions, which is uh, probably one of the end users of uh, a lot of our products, as well as uh, Lamana Developments. Um, then we've got uh, uh, Monia Limited, which is um, a building, uh, you know, a construction material supply business, where we um, quarry the material mm. um, out, of the, out of the resource and then we um, either uh, produce it into a ready mix concrete or um, I guess, uh, I guess um, masonry products or um, precast uh, uh, products as well. And um, so that, that way we um, cut down on a lot of um, I guess uh, the need to import a lot of uh, materials, but in saying that, we do need to import um, certain uh, items like, um, I guess, uh, bitumen and um, and uh, cement and um, and fuel. Mm. And so that obviously um, c c you can't escape that. Can't escape no. that, and that's um, that's a fact of life. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, looking further further ahead, one of the features, I guess, of both steamships and Lamana Develop and, and Number One Super as organisations is the longer term view that you're able to take on the development of this kind, which is why, of course, you can sink your, soul, sink your teeth into a larger project. Um, Rupert, you've got a substantial project you're looking to do next to um, Motor Kia Port in yep. Port Moresby, Moresby. Can you talk um, not just about that project as far as what, what it's going to be about, and we have some pictures if, if, this, if we could put them up on screen while we talk, um, but also, um, 
how that fits into your longer term strategy and how your longer term thinking influences the kind of project you're able to develop? Yes, I mean, I think the, the, the first thing for Steamies is yeah. that all of our planning and our strategic planning is, is predicated on no new resource projects going ahead. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talk, you know, as a country, understandably, we, we focus on the LNG projects, we focus on the mining projects in most of these conferences. But when we do our own internal planning, we assume that none of them will go ahead. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we're, we're reliant, and, and most of these projects are not ours, and we've, 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 <laughs> we've got range view up there, yeah. specifically just to sort of make a more broad, yeah. broad comment. all these slides over, that's all. Yeah. Yep. Um, a, bro a broader comment about the nature of projects in PNG, mm. in that most of us in, in this industry, we're reliant on not the big resource projects, but the underlying economy yeah. growing. Uh, and I think it was Justin that was showing that it's growing, the non-extractive industry is growing at about 3%. Mm. So we're making our decisions um, based on uh, assumptions around the underlying economy growing. And that's vital for us. And we need policy stability for that. Uh, and we need to take the longer term view. Mm. And that we can do because we've been there for 105 years and we intend to be around for, for an equal amount of time. Uh, and therefore, the investors that we're a um, listed company, but the, our investors understand mm. the through cycle nature of our investments. And I think that's probably the key to our success is that we're not trying to mm. adjust our strategy year on year. Mm. We're taking that, you know, for, for us, for Steamies, short term is five to 10 years. Mm. But in doing that, you're having to think, well, what is, what is the country going to be like in five, 10, 15 years time, aren't you? You're making, having to make quite a detailed projection of the kind of demand there might be next to the port. So what's actually going to be next to the, the port? Under so the, the, the port itself is trying to uh, reflect some of the government's policies. Uh, we do intend to have a fully integrated industrial uh, business park. Uh, we will be making it an SEZ. Yeah. Um, and the idea there is that we'll capture some of the downstream industries uh, that the government is trying to prioritize. Um, but that's only one of four investments that we've got coming mm. online. We have uh, the redevelopment of a, a Melanesian site in Ley. We have a large hotel, yep. uh, hotel and, and, and mixed use, uh, okay. similar to what we've been talking about yeah. uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, and then a large development up in Mount Hagen, uh, and then an, an additional uh, Port Moresby investment as well. Mm. So our view now is that um, probably more than any time that I've been there in the sort of four and a half mm. years that, I, that I've been based in, in, in PNG, that the investment climate is beginning to come back and give us confidence to invest not just in Port Moresby mm. and not just in resource-based uh, industries uh, and hospitality that's often reliant on the, on the passengers coming in and out, uh, but in the underlying economy in the second cities. Mm. Would you agree with that observation, Paul, that, that, that is, you know, moving forward, there is the, going to be the growth to take up these major projects? There, there seems to be that, there's certainly the lift, so the easiest way that you can check that is, is what we're seeing within the, the property take up, so uh, the residences that are filling up, so yep. certainly seeing that the residents are, are filling up across the area. I imagine Steamships is um, having the same sort of uh, aspect coming into the, mm. the um, site. So you're seeing that on the property. Property has been quite uh, damp for the last few years, so it's been, been held back and then through COVID and now you're starting to see that lift coming through. And I think part of what we've also tried to do with those developments is that you're not just reliant on that residence. So mm. what we've tried to do with some of those areas is that you do have mixed use. So where something is actually working, something may not be, but you actually get that blend and you're taking a portfolio approach rather than just a single asset and single view that this is all tied into that one particular mm. area. So. so how much of that is about competing with other properties of a similar type and how much of it is just anticipating general growth in the, in the, uh, in the market and the, or the demand for these kind of uh, facilities? Um, well, I don't think we actually sit down and go, oh, steamships are, are there trying to beat us or, or do something else. And, one of the pictures you had up was one of our old buildings yeah. that, um, that we decided that we wanted to move out of, uh, sold it, steamships have picked it up and, and have developed it and again it's there for a different use so it's quite nice to see that you are actually working in some degree, mm. uh, although you know, you're, you're competing for tenants, there is that, that wider picture that you know, we want the whole economy to lift. Yep. So it's not just, well, we can, we can do so well over to here. We're looking for how does the rest of that actually economy is coming together mm. and where does it make sense to actually position some of those buildings so you actually get a, a flow on and a better, a better city for Port Moresby in some aspects that you're actually thinking that wider side of things. So, you know, steamships have put that 
uh, south part in and there's those three buildings that we sold off that have come uh, into other people's hands. They've developed them and again you're starting to see that city revitalised. Well, that helps us with our other buildings elsewhere in the city as well. So there is a flow on. So success, pre success and I guess yep. then generates refurbishment in the older properties. Exactly. And so it so moves right. on. George, what about the skills base in PNG to develop these kind of projects? How much are you able to deploy local skills and how much do you need to rely sometimes on imported skills? Um, no, it's uh, it's very very important to um, to deliver on quality, yep. um, and that's what um, I guess a lot of our businesses um, focus on. Whether it's the, um, the the construction headspace, but also the hospitality headspace as well, um, we always try and uh, develop up through uh, develop the local uh, content and uh, develop the skills because they um, the national nationals will be there forever. Mm. Um, but we we do realise that uh, there, there has to be um, passing on of knowledge and training and and skill set. So we do um, import, um, I guess, uh, uh, particular skills, uh, mm. positions that we just go, okay, that's going to be a, an expat and they're going to have to try and train up mm. locals and, um, and have that uh, passing of knowledge over whether it's been over the last five years or 10 year program, mm. but um, we've got a bit of a, um, a game plan around that. Mm -hmm. uh, and Rupert, you touched on the issue of standards um, in, in the industry. And I guess that's something that uh, I know you're a part of the Property Developers Association, which is a new, newly developed um, organization for like-minded developers um, to join together and start to kind of work more uh, commonly on, on shared values and shared um, uh, industry voice. So how important is it that the industry as a whole develops an understanding of what standards mean in Papua New Guinea? I think in the longer term it's critical. Yeah, you know, as, as Paul mentioned, we I mean, we do spend a lot of time looking at what these guys are doing. Mm. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, the industry has to cooperate together. Yeah, uh, and and there's probably three key areas to that, and that's what the Property Developers Association was was founded. All three of us are, are members of it, um, and that is to look at these standards and trying to encourage a general improvement in standards across the board. Mm. Um, and the second then is to really focus on the regulatory environment that supports those standards, but also supports the development of an industry uh, for the benefit not mm. just of an individual player, um, but for society as a whole and as the industry as a whole. And then the last piece, Lars was talking in an earlier session about uh, the lack of, of REITs and property trusts, yes. liquidity within the property market. Uh, the banking sector is, is a vital component to that, but so is the ability to buy and sell and trade properties, both at an individual and at an aggregate level. Mm. So the, the PDA is, is looking at all of those three areas, the standards, but then also at, uh, at the regulatory environment and, mm. and, and also then just trying to get the town planning, uh, advocate for a joined up set of town planning in Moresby, but also in the other centres. Mm -hmm. So town planning is responsibility of the municipality at the moment? Yes, correct. Yeah. Well, it, it's complicated because you've got the national and the sub-national ones. Uh, and in somewhere like uh, Mount Hagen, uh, it's, it's still done at a national level rather than the, than the sub-national level. Uh, and I think being able to develop uh, good local planning capabilities mm -hmm. uh, is important for all of the towns as they develop. You know, we've got a young urbanising population uh, we still have a lot of green space in our cities. Mm -hmm. It's important that we protect them and plan for the infrastructure, the road, the power, the sewage, the in, you know, fibre optic um, backbone for all of the cities. It's important that we do that before it becomes too late. Mm -hmm. Paul, we've talked previously on, uh, at events such as this about um, leveraging the capital you have available and the best way of doing, the best instruments for doing that. Uh, a, do you see any progress or what would you be arguing for as far as reforms in this area that would enable investors in the sector to actually um, make more of the money that they, either not necessarily make more money available, but make the money that they have available work harder? Well, I think Rupert was, was touching on certain areas there and we face that same challenge within the, the superannuation area. Um, when we think about P&G and the number of people, so I have 200,000 people within the super fund in, I think it's got about 600,000. So there's 800,000 people in super. We think the population is nine or 10 million. And so you've got 10% of people actually mm. involved in, in superannuation, which is probably the, the biggest way that most people save uh, through, the, through the country. And that's, that's the main savings that people have. 
And I think one of the things is around how do you actually bring in other people to make advantage of what we're actually doing. Yeah. So how can you actually get part of that population? And we heard earlier today about changes to the PNGX, thinking about how it's the stock exchange, but also is there other avenues for saving vehicles that actually give people access to some of those assets? And also, you know, some of these investments are, are 500 million for us. Now, who's going to buy us out of that particular asset? So who's the other party that you actually deal with inside PNG to look at the other side if you are actually looking to exit from some of those particular mm. properties? So how can you actually make this a, a better environment for other people mm. to invest, to make use of it, and also to think about where, where should we be putting the funds? Now, we've got 200 hectares that we've been fighting for 40 years over um, out the back at, at Nine Mile, and you know, we, we talk about putting 2,500 houses in there. Now we need roads, we need power, we need water, we need sewerage. Mm. And those businesses aren't capitalised. And so if we're capitalising to put that, those facilities in, then we're looking for a payback and that payback lifts the price of, of houses, which then doesn't make it necessarily affordable as what people would like it to be. Mm. So I think there's a role that, that needs to be played by this, the, the sums that we're generating and how we can use that to support government initiatives support some of those SOEs and think about, well, how can we actually get a better, better country from that savings pool? Mm. And that savings pool has certainly grown over that, that period of time. But when you look down and into Australia, you talk about three trillion sitting here in super funds and you're saying, well, is there the opportunity to bring some of those capital into the country in PNG, mm. partner up and utilise that to get some of that infrastructure, that backbone that, that we've been talking about to be really setting things up so people can have a really good capital and a really good country. Uh, clearly, in all, most of these projects, there's multiple partners involved. There's partners with different skill bases. How important is it to choose the right partner? And when you're looking for a partner on a, on a development of this kind, George, what are the key features of that partnership? What, what has to work for that partnership to be successful? Well, um, I guess for partnerships, um, it's, when you when you set out for a, when you're de developing a project, um, mm. having the right partners, but in all different levels, um, and a good communication base um, between all the partners, and making sure that um, everyone's on the same page and has the common goal of whether it's return or um, developing uh, return on investment or mm. um, delivery of time scale, depending on whether, whether it's a contracting base or property developer base, you've just got to have that uh, clear, concise uh, communications around. All the, um, the all parties, so that um, you can just reach that common goal. Mm. And how are you dealing with? I mean, I, before I, I noticed, I was watching Peter Larden's face when um, uh, one of the economists was pointing out the supply chain challenges that they're anticipating and some of the delays that's going to mean for some of the major projects yeah. um, that we're planning. Um, in your own head, are you already planning for mitigation of those supply chain issues? Yeah, no, definitely. It's um, something that's been on my mind for at least a, a, a year or six, seven yeah. months now. Um, it's, I guess, I guess the, when you when you bring it back to say one of the projects that we've worked on is um, the NADZAP redevelopment project, and we signed that contract uh, back in. Uh, as a subcontractor back in um, 2020. Mm. In 2020, we didn't know that there was going to be a COVID situation because no. we, we signed it in um, January 22, I think it was, and mm. um, we heard about uh, COVID and, and what have you, but it wasn't really a thing. Mm. Um, so when, when you've got long long periods and then you've got, uh, then when you go through the project and everything's going okay, then COVID hits and you've got delays there, then you've got, um, then you've got uh, supply chain delays. Uh, it really comes down to um, procuring as much material on site as possible. So it, it reduces the risk um, for, I guess, um, at the end of the project, uh, I guess, liquidated damages. So what I'm trying to say is um, if, it's a, if it's a critical item, and, um, and it's on your um, development schedule mm. and you've got, um, and it's on the critical path, um, and if it's, if it's going to hold up the project in a, any shape, way or form, what we've done and typically we've done in the past is procure as much of that um, item as possible from the outset. Because if, that, if you don't have that um, arriving on time, on site, then it will push the project out. And then if you've got a hard um, liquidated damage clause, 
at the end for a contractor, then um, yeah, then and, and, and it's not good. <laughs> it's not going well. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you. Each of you might have a different view on this. Um, we've seen in the last 15 years or so, Port Moresby has benefited enormously from a lot of development, um, real estate and accommodation and retail and so on. Um, that hasn't necessarily been the case in other parts of Papua New Guinea. Um, you mentioned a couple of projects you're doing outside of the major, uh, the capital, um, Rupert, but I'm wondering what uh, the prospects are for maybe spending more of that investment dollar out, outside of Port Moresby. I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, that's exactly the conclusion that we've come to, yeah. is that, that time has now got to the stage where some of these, where Ley and Hagen are both very substantial hubs in their own right. Um, and of the just, just under a billion Kina that we've got in the investment pipeline, uh, three quarters of that is outside Port Moresby. Wow. Um, so, uh, yes, in the past it's been smaller investments in all of those cities. Mm -hmm. Now we're beginning to see the scale uh, that demands sort of these larger mixed use joint mm -hmm. venture type uh, developments in, in, in the secondary cities. Mm -hmm. But I think you can't get away from the fact that Port Moresby is the larger city. Yep. Um, it is where the vast majority of the population lives and where a vast majority of the, uh, of, of the residential and commercial money is spent. And that is why it tends to attract mm. uh, the, the majority of the investment, naturally. Yeah. Paul, um, you, people must be to your door. I mean, you and Ian yeah. Trudio, I was going to say, probably two of the most popular men in Papua New Guinea. You're the men with the sack of gold. Um, <laughs> but are you seeing many prospective projects outside of Moresby? Um, we do. We, we've certainly looked at different areas and I think um, just so if this live streaming back to PNG, there's no money in our building. So <laughs> everyone thinks that we've got this cash, the nine billion or something. It's not in my office. It's nowhere. Right? It's, it's all invested into something else. So I just make it very clear that it's pointless um, looking for that from us. We, we, we certainly have um, buildings and, and th certain things around in Lay. We've also down into uh, Gazelle. We came out of Alatau. Uh, but when we think of the, the fund, when we're looking about an investment, so our minimum investment is roughly about 30 million and it's probably getting up to about 50 million Kina. Mm. So when you start to think about, when you're looking through that investment proposal into, into an area, you need to think about, well, how am I putting those particular funds to use and able to generate that sort of return? And, and Rupert, it's nice going up to Hagen and seeing that Hagen is, is continuing to develop through and there's probably some areas that you can, can look at to expand into to those areas. And I think. Uh, for us, again, we've been very much Moresby lay centric and you know, we're going through a process looking at where do we expand out into. Mm -hmm. But also what the super funds do, which is slightly different to, to what um, the, the shareholders in, in um, steamships do, is that we actually provide to the state about four and a half to five billion kina. And we provide that through treasury bills and GIS, government inscribed stock. So, one of the, the issues is really around that if we're not able to see that development opportunities in that particular area, and it may not be at the level that we're looking for, there is a role there with the state that has access to that funding from both super funds to think about, well, how does it use those funds to develop those particular areas? So you know, often the super funds are, why aren't you actually putting money, hard money in that particular specific area? Well. There is a vehicle and an avenue that people can actually utilise for those funds that have been generated from all those participants mm. back into those particular areas. And it's really up for, that, for the state and for its planning to look at, well, what is it actually going to use and how can it use those funds mm. best to deliver some of those services or buildings or whatever else is required in those particular areas. So there is a way of, of channelling those funds that we're generating from Moresby or from all our members across the country back into specific areas. It doesn't necessarily have to be the super fund itself to do it. The state has actually got access to capital through the funds mm. to actually go through and, and look at whether it's get able to make the return it wants uh, and, and pay us our, our interest rates that we're getting on those particular assets. Mm. Talking of the state, we have a new government um, uh, in the final stages of being formed as we sit here. Um, and I guess it would be interesting to know from your own, each of your own perspectives what you would see as the priority <coughs> for government as far as action to make your, your sector more successful or healthy or uh, more conducive to business. Maybe we start with you, George. Um, I'd, I'd like to see um, some continue, um, some continue uh, 
same strategy as what they were before. Um, so uh, PNG Connect, um, obviously I've, I've probably a bit more one-sided on this issue being a, a contractor and um, mm. and the uh, material supply um, business. But um, so whether it's uh, roads, uh, PNG Connect through the roads or um, through the the PNG Ports expansion, I'd like to see all those projects um, uh, facil facilitated and carried through all uh, to from now to, to when they um, plan to complete it all. Um, so that's that's probably one of the main things uh, for as a group what we'd like. So that's to guarantee do. finance for those projects rather than yeah. sort of semi financing them or yeah. yeah that's right. So and it just makes it a lot more streamlined and you know where the money's coming from when you know how how, how to deliver these projects. So yeah, no, that's much it. Yep. Um, Rupert. So I think that for me I'll draw on two things. I mean obviously the, the, the policy and regulatory um, continuity and stability is, is critical. And I think the, it was interesting if you look at the Prime Minister's inaugural speech, the buried down in the bottom of page eight was this piece where he's talking very much about trying to encourage investment into the general economy. Mm -hmm. and making a big point about saying that he wants to try and encourage exactly the type of businesses that we have here up on stage to invest more, the, mm. the good corporate citizens, yeah. if you like. And I think that's an important change in messaging, perhaps from the harder line take back PNG, mm. which, which got uh, misunderstood outside the country. Mm. Uh, and it was seen as being very aggressively uh, nationalistic. Mm. It perhaps wasn't, it was perhaps lost in the nuance of translation. So I think that's one thing that's encouraging, I'd like to see more of. Mm. And the second is the completion of the strata title process. Right. Um, when John Rosso was, uh, was Minister for Lands, uh, just before the government uh, rose, the legislation was passed, but we've now got to work through the enabling uh, regulations. Mm. And that process is ongoing, and I'd like to see that picked up, because that's what will really change the uh, industry. You know, mm. Clarence said that real estate is the single biggest draw of foreign investment over the in aggregate over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Well, if we can get strata title in place and functioning, then that will be a, a game changer for the uh, property industry. Mm -hmm. So that means more sales of fl uh, flats, apartments, and so and on. When you've got all this money tied yeah. up in Kina that can't leave, mm -hmm. um, but you don't have a legal mechanism of trading property mm -hmm. um, and, a, and, and sort of the liquidity and the fluidity in the market, you need the assets to be fungible, and they're not yet. Right. So if we get that, uh, then I, will, I think you'd, you'd see a lot of Papua New Guineans benefiting because they can then join a normal property investment industry mm. as we see anywhere else in, a, in the world and that we currently don't have. Paul, what do you think the priorities should be? I'm sure my chair will tell me that I'm chasing the rent from the government over the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> so pay your bills. The, yeah. pay, pay the bills. And I think that's part of also not just for ourselves, but it's that whole thing around that the economy, getting the economy, you know, we talk about that we've got a lot of liquidity in the economy, the state can raise the funds, get that economy actually flowing through. So I think part of it is actually, you know, the reforms that, that Rupert's talked about, but we're also looking at, at superannuation reforms and part of the, the central bank reforms, looking at how can we actually make, you know, things better as a country that allows those other little um, cogs to work so much more efficiently. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's part of the, the challenges in there is to, to making sure that we can, in fact, get some of this investment and get some of the things actually moving through that allows people to benefit. So we talked about the reforms in, in strata title, the reforms on the PX, the reforms in, in superannuation and life insurance and those particular areas, and then making sure that you've actually got an economy and a, a country that's paying its bills. So mm -hmm. for us, having that right budget, sticking to the budget and paying you know, not just the, the big fund, but I, if, if we're missing 160 million over three years, I wonder what the, the small guys are missing and what they're getting punished for in that, that process of waiting for, for rents to be paid or their bills to be paid. And I think Zani talked about it as to how those mechanisms work. 